The Downtown Vancouver Business Improvement Association is proud to support BIV's daily Coping with COVID podcast series. And now that there is a plan to safely restart BC, we hope you'll join us in supporting your favorite local businesses. From restaurants to retail, our downtown businesses need us now more than ever. Thanks everyone and stay safe. I'm Tyler Orton, and before we get to today's interview, here are some of the top stories we're following at Business in Vancouver. The extradition process for Huawei executive Meng Wanzhou will continue following a judge's decision on double criminality in the case. The decision means the conduct Meng is accused of in the United States has been deemed an arrestable offense here in Canada. Proceedings will continue June 3rd. And the union representing BC grocery workers at Save On Foods is urging the company to extend its pandemic premium for employees. The grocer had been paying a premium to workers, but announced last week it was ending the pay bump. A union representative called the move a shock and a disappointment. That's it for now. Now for our interview. Thanks for joining us today at VIV Daily. I'm Kirk LaPointe, publisher and editor-in-chief. A little bit of a departure from our COVID-19 coverage today to talk about Meng Wanzhou, the chief financial officer of Huawei Technologies, who has been uh, under arrest in our city uh, since December of 2018. And today had a hearing in which uh, it was possible that the judge was going to rule she could could leave uh, apprehension and uh, leave the country, go back uh, to China. Uh, but it turned out that, in fact, uh, she didn't get her way today. That, uh, the, you know, in a way, her her hearing now will uh, will continue for her extradition. Uh, the extradition application the United States has made in order to bring her there to face some charges. It's uh, a little bit of a surprising development because I think a lot of people thought that this was the one area of the challenge to the extradition that might be successful for her. And of course, there are lots of complications for us as a country involving our relationship to China, particularly during the pandemic that uh, that we want to explore. Mario Canseco is the president of Research Co. He writes for us a couple of times weekly at Glacier Media on, on issues and conducts some public opinion research for us as well. Good to have you with us. Great to be here, Kirk. Thank you. Tell me a little bit about uh, about what people have have thought about this case anyway in, in the time that we've had to explore it, which is now going on a year and a half. Well, uh, there's been a lot of consistency when it comes to the findings related to the Mong Fan Joe case and the way Canadians feel about Huawei. And if anything, what we've seen now is a level of animosity that is quite high. Uh, we started asking this question uh, back in, in February 2019, and we had uh, only 57% of Canadians who didn't want uh, Huawei to get involved in the development of Canada's 5G network, that number is now 75%. So it's three out of four Canadians who essentially don't want this to happen. Obviously, the backdrop of the COVID-19 pandemic, all of the questions related to China, the fact that we have somebody who has been arrested, who works for Huawei, is making a lot of uh, changes in the way Canadians feel about this, but there has been a lot of consistency. This wasn't an issue where most Canadians were saying, yes, Huawei is welcome to be part of of the 5G network. Uh, And now we have a number that is the highest that I've seen in four rounds that we've been doing this. Is it worrisome the tenor of some of the response that you're getting in public research, Mario? Is it it, uh, it tinged with a lot of racism? I think what I see more than anything is uh, there's definitely a reaction here in BC that is uh, quite striking. I think we've seen a situation here where uh, the level of information related to the way China operates uh, really builds on the animosity towards Huawei. Uh, But I think we see Canadians essentially being able to differentiate uh, in a situation that is related to how we handle uh, Chinese Canadians who are here, how we behave in public, uh, certain things that are definitely racist that have been going on for the past few weeks related to COVID-19, with the animosity that some are feeling towards the specific uh, government of China and the fact that they don't want Huawei to be here. So I think those two things aren't necessarily connected. Uh, It's more an issue of real deep concerns uh, within Canadians of what could happen if a company like Huawei becomes involved in 5G. And, and what are they that are that our technology would somehow be, uh, you know, up for grabs that we would lose our privacy uh, that, you know, somehow the data 
will be shared in the wrong way. What, what are the apprehensions that Canadians tend to have there? Well, I think more than anything, it's the idea uh, that you're not really working for a corporation, that you're working for a government. And that has been one of the major problems. We would not see this type of situation if we were talking about Nokia, for instance. There's no animosity towards other governments in the same way that we've seen uh, towards Beijing. And I think that is one of the main reasons for the numbers to be like this. Uh, it, there's a difference in dealing with specific uh, corporations uh, that are not necessarily tied to a specific government. Uh, most Canadians cannot make that difference when it comes to Huawei and China. And I think we see it in, in, in some of the other questions that we ask. Uh, the number of residents of Canada who would like to establish closer ties uh, with China is now only 14%. Uh, it's a negligible number at best for a country that is supposed to be very important when it comes to trade. Well, it is important to trade. Of course, in British Columbia, we're, we're the largest trading partner in Canada uh, with, with China. Um, but uh, you can see that in Justin Trudeau's answers uh, every day that he comes out of the cottage and talks to reporters, uh, he's been very, very reticent about discussing Huawei in particular, and discussing the 5G decision that the Canadian government has. I wonder whether um, perhaps the prime minister was expecting that, that maybe the court today might clear um, Meng Wanzhou and permit her to travel home. Um, and that in a way that would then give the Canadian government a little bit of a clearer path to, to state what it intends to do. Well, there's definitely an expectation. And I think, you know, part of the situation that we've seen in this case is the differences in the way the two governments behave with each other when it comes to, to, to uh, matters of the judiciary. Uh, we've already seen reaction on some of the Chinese media related to a decision that should have been taken by Justin Trudeau himself, which is essentially ignorant of the way Canadian systems operate and work. Um, it's complex in the sense that it's not going to be easy for Canada to justify going into a decision that has been rejected many times by most Canadians and that at this particular time is being rejected by three out of four Canadians. So there's no justification for this. I, I don't think there's a way for the federal government to say that they definitely want to do this because of everything that is in the background, but also because it's not a situation that is necessarily popular for the government right now. They've been handling COVID-19 very well. We've seen consistently two thirds of Canadians saying that they're happy with the way the federal government has handled this pandemic. Um, why go against Canadians who have, have said repeatedly that they don't want Huawei to essentially play a role in this thing? And yet Huawei has been in this country uh, for some time. It has, uh, it has a pretty uh, extensive investment in our universities uh, in terms of doing the research. I mean, it's a sponsor of Hockey Night in Canada, if we ever get that back. Um, hmm. You know, in a large way, I mean, the Trudeau government is risking turning back the clock considerably and losing a fair amount of investment um, from, from a very large company and uh, making some of our country's telecom uh, firms, um, they basically pull out a lot of, you know, a lot of their own infrastructural investment in all of this. It, you know, is this the time maybe where Justin Trudeau could kind of get this done without there being grand attention to it, given that we've got much more concern about COVID? This is probably the best moment for them to announce something like this. Uh, you know that there's a cloud of suspicion because of the Mon Juan Joe case. You know that the extradition is going to continue at least for the next little while. Uh, she's not going back to China. This is perhaps the moment when you're able to say, we've made a final decision on this, and this is the way we are going to be acting. Uh, also, one of the things that really should be pointed out is uh, when Huawei went into this charm offensive six months ago, sponsoring Hockey Night in Canada, being everywhere, having all of those social media ads as well, talking about how everybody was going to be building a new network in Canada and we should work together, it barely moved the needle. What moved the needle now, and it's essentially a needle that is moving further and further away from finding Huawei as a welcome a, a partner in 5G development, was COVID-19. If anything, it has heightened the fears of many Canadians uh, of the way in which uh, China works. And, and this is one of the reasons for the numbers to be as high as they are right now. Yeah, and yet we're going to have to deal with the fact that uh, technologically, we're going to need something 
to help us with uh, contact tracing here in the pandemic. Um, we seem prepared almost to let Google and Apple have at us, but not Huawei. You know, well, that is definitely part of the uh, situation that we're going to be uh, dealing with in the next few months. Uh, we've seen a little bit of this libertarianism in the form of, all, uh, of retired politicians uh, talking about how uncomfortable they would be going to a restaurant and leaving their phone number behind. Uh, unbeknownst to them, most reservations happen this way. But, you know, we haven't seen a situation where libertarianism is essentially playing a role in the way Canadians look at anything. If that were the case, if these ideas were popular, Maxime Bernier would have a seat in the House of Commons, and he doesn't. Yeah. Well, it, you can see, of course, also uh, the fact that uh, Justin Trudeau is having to navigate the overall bilateral uh, relationship with China at the moment. He's been um, a little cautious in his wording about his own concerns about how China handled uh, the initial eruption of COVID-19. Um, he's not really joined terribly much the, the clarion call for you know a, a big, large, independent inquiry uh, into how that's handling. Um, why do you think he's he's being as reticent as he is at the moment? Does he just need China to be of assistance to Canada over the long term, and this is not the time to blow up that bridge? No, I think that's definitely part of it. It's probably not the best moment uh, to do something like this or to call for uh, a different way of doing things. In our own polling, we have seen consistently that more than two-thirds of Canadians want some sort of contrition on the part of China related to COVID-19. It doesn't necessarily mean that they're seeking a lawsuit, and the level of support for that has been fairly small, partly because it's a very complicated and convoluted matter uh, to happen. Uh, but ultimately, I think it's, necess it's necessary for the federal government to try to handle this in a much more a, a poignant way. Uh, you don't want to risk a situation where you criticize a specific government and you end up looking like Donald Trump in the White House, who has been blaming China for pretty much everything right now, except uh, Twitter censoring his tweets. Yeah. Uh, and yet it is, it's a pretty delicate dance for, uh, for our government because it, of course, has this relationship with the United States that with or without Donald Trump is going to, of course, persist. Um, if Canada decides that it's going to choose the Huawei technology for 5G, what do you think that does with our relationship with the Americans? It could be very detrimental, of course. You know, there is a situation here where you're dealing with your largest trading partner. They have already said that they don't want Huawei involved in any way, shape, or form. Uh, there's been many discussions about what can happen if you have Canada doing something with a specific company and the U.S. doesn't. And you know, part of the situation here, and I think this is also part of the animosity that we see, particularly in Alberta towards Huawei is what has happened before uh, with Chinese intervention in Canadian companies. Uh, Nexon didn't go very well. We've seen a lot of discussions uh, related to firings, to the way in which that specific company has worked or not worked, for that matter, after China decided to get involved. So there are some experiences out there uh, that are making Canadians uneasy. And when you're thinking about something that is going to be involved in our smartphones, in our homes, in our laptops, uh, it's definitely making people uh, more worried than they were before. Yeah. Always good to talk to you, Mario. I really appreciate your time today. Thanks for jumping on the call as quickly after uh, after the hearing today. I was, I was a little surprised. Were you surprised? Um, I was a little surprised, partly because of the uh, pictures that were taking of Mang Kwan Yu outside the court just a few days ago, or a few hours ago, I should say. Uh, it seemed that, like they were expecting something that was completely different, uh, yeah. but you yeah. know, this is the way it is. Yeah, it is the way it is. Thanks for your time. My pleasure, anytime. And you've been watching BIB Daily. I'm Kurt LaPointe, publisher and editor-in-chief at BIB. We'll see you again.